Welcome to this BSIS webinar on the subject of construction cost management. We're going to be asking and hopefully answering um, how can cost data improve project performance? I'm Richard McLean, the Chief Markets Officer at BCIS, uh, and this particular webinar has come from various conversations uh, that I've had and my team have had uh, with a number of our clients. So uh, we're really hoping this can uh, help with uh, a lot of the challenges uh, that we've got. So just a quick bit of housekeeping before we start. Uh, the presentation will last around 25 minutes. Uh, you can submit questions by clicking the questions uh, mark icon on the toolbar. Uh, there'll also be an opportunity to submit any questions you have on the feedback survey that you receive after this webinar by email. We'll then publish all of the questions and answers as well as a recording of this webinar onto the website. Um, so don't worry, we will send this link to you where you can find it once it's available. So here's the agenda for today. Uh, first of all, we'll take a look at the different kinds of cost data we have and how they're used in estimates for projects of all shapes and sizes. We'll examine just how much the costs that are used in estimates can be impacted by environmental factors. As we all know, lately, these external influences have been numerous. We'll also explore what can happen if you don't use appropriate cost data and some of the problems that can arise. With that in mind, uh, we'll then move on to some of the ways in which you can make sure that you're using the right cost data for unique circumstances of your project. And finally, we'll look at the positive impact that using cost data appropriately can have on your project performance and ultimately the project's balance sheet. So clearly, when we're talking about construction cost data, it can look very different depending on uh, which stage of the project we're focusing on and whether we're talking a top down or bottom up approach. As you'll see, um, as you'll be more than familiar, uh, we start with high level data. Uh, then we have elemental, so superstructure, substructure, uh, then composite rates. And finally, the most detailed level where we're looking at the individual resources that make up unit rates. To take an example of a new hospital, uh, in early stages of estimating, we're looking at a fairly superficial data. At the highest level, it could be on a cost per bed basis or a cost per meter squared basis. Um, we're not accounting for, and we most likely don't even know yet, the specific characteristics that are going to impact on the costs of all kinds of different ways as a project progresses. But from that broad brush starting point, estimates will become more specific and more accurate as cost plans become more detailed right through to knowing all of the labour, plant and material requirements for each part of the project. To take a couple of examples of what this might look like with BCIS data, uh, keeping with the example of a hospital, in our average prices, we have cost data for different kinds of hospital facilities providing a range of high level cost estimates. From there, we can travel all the way down to individual resources, in this case, labour operative used in a major works estimating guide, uh, where we have a cost per hour for completing a specific work activity. Looking now uh, across the project stages from conception to design, uh, the building operation and the maintenance and ultimately end of life, uh, the cost data we have clearly varies considerably. And those differences are largely due to the fact that we actually have at those different points of time. So at the appraisal stage, uh, we might know that the building is and possibly its size, uh, but how much in the way of specification. However, if we move through the stages, the information we have about the project becomes more detailed. And so therefore, does the cost data we need to input? It's only after this build is complete that we can have a proper understanding of what is actually used in the construction phase and what, if any, variations were made to the plans. Similarly, when trying to predict the ongoing maintenance and replacement costs, we can make a judgment based on typical life expectancies of components and consider usage profiles based on assumptions over the life of a building. However, it isn't until we're at the operational phase that we start to understand how much maintenance work has actually been carried out. And this constant evolution of what we know, of course, translates into levels of confidence at each stage of the project. 
Here we have a cone of uncertainty, um, a kind of funnel leading us through greater accuracy to the holy grail of absolute cost certainty, which, of course, none of us can ever, ever attain. Uh, but here what we see is that at the beginning of the appraisal stage, uh, then we're not certain about the build. Uh, tolerance in our cost estimates will range quite considerably. You can also see um, that you can be above or below. Uh, in some cases, tolerances may be well over plus or minus 50 percent. As we get more information, the more accurate those cost predictions become. But of course, not all cost data is created equal. You might be pulling in numbers from a range of sources, some more reliable than others. Um, what you're ideally looking for is credible data. So here are some of the sources of data uh, that are used in BCIS products and in cost calculations. Uh, these range from producer price indices, some of which are not publicly available uh, through the prices from building merchants. One of the sources used to update our estimating guides. Um, some are sourced externally, so uh, like statistics from ONS and others come from our own subscribers uh, for builder quantities, cost analyses, uh, which we're able to analyse and use, particularly in early stage estimating. As well as helping to guide our cost calculations, these sources are also useful for when the industry as a whole and considered the most significant cost drivers are now um, and what they're likely to be in the future. Clearly, you would have had to have been hiding under a rock or not turning up to work in the last few years to not know the sheer number of stresses there have been on the construction industry, both in terms of the impact of costs on productivity and the impact on costs for external forces. I won't put you through a potted history of what all of these have been, but here are some examples of the kinds of issues that we've been talking about in the last year or so at BCIS. So repairs and maintenance cost increases, uh, BCIS materials cost index, materials costs continue to grow at an unprecedented rate, uh, sharing the risk of inflation in construction and procurement, house builders costs up 15% in the last year, costs of meeting new building regulations applied to ABI, BCIS house rebuilding cost index, uh, BCIS price data sets revised to include unprecedented construction cost increases, Updated BCIS data sets include items to deliver Z net zero CO2 emissions in line with building regulation changes. House building costs continue to increase. Despite falling demand, tender prices are expected to rise over five year building forecasts. Maintenance cost increases vary significantly between trades. Costs for small building works have increased. House building cost inflation eases in response to sector contraction. New construction output forecasts to contract in 2023-24 as new housing output declines. Scottish housing construction prices fall. Insolvencies and profits warning in the construction industry. I would uh, also highly recommend, um, just while we're going through these titles, if you haven't already watched some of the recent webinars, uh, including in our construction inflation series, uh, we've here considered a lot of environmental drivers and the impact on those projects happening now. Uh, I think it's important to stress again the merit in considering construction cost data with some contextual understanding of what's happening across the whole of the industry, because, of course, nothing happens in isolation. That awareness is crucial, for example, when we're forecasting costs and considering what the impact on costs is likely to be going forward. What I want to touch on today are a few examples of how these things that are going on around us in the world can be seen in the data that we use and the impact that might have while we're trying to work through those project stages to achieve your aim and increase in accuracy of cost. So this data is hot off the press uh, with our estimating guides, which we data on printed price books and our online schedule of rates. Uh, so this is our major works, our minor works and alterations and refurb data sets. Uh, there was on average an increase of 8.1% from the second quarter of last year to the second quarter of this year. But within that average increase, there is significant variability. This chart shows a selection of trades which are presented in those data sets. And as you can see, they're not uniform. And this isn't to say, of course, that structural steel work is now really cheap, but we're seeing in comparing year to year, just how much those prices are actually hiked up. 
And in fact, if we look specifically at one of our civil engineering and specialist engineering indices, uh, which is tracking structural steelwork, the materials cost inflation specifically, you can now see how recent prices are still historically high with this chart going back to the end of 2013. Looks like it's sending a bit of the message to the industry, doesn't it? So looking at some more of our indices now, uh, this chart takes all of the figures from series three um, and for our building price adjustment formula indices, commonly referred to in the industry as PAFI. Um, across PAFI, we track the cost inflation for more than 200 buildings, civil engineering, specialist engineering, and highways maintenance activities. So some of the indices are all in, so weighted for labor plant and material resources, and some are specified by resource type. The time frame here covers a period roughly from the global financial crisis through to the latest figures from July this year and everything that's happened in between. Uh, I won't bog, bog you down with the individual lines by index, um, but while we are there are clear patterns in movement. There are also significant outliers. And I think you can also see quite clearly how markets have reacted to particular global events. So from the financial crisis in the UK's exit from the EU and, of course, through the pandemic. In this next chart, uh, we uh, from the same building series, actually, um, but this is looking at period just prior to COVID up to July this year. And picking up on a few things uh, from a few indexes, we can see again that there is huge variability in that movement. Here we can see the annual inflation movement in working with steel piling in blue, uh, precast concrete in yellow and softwood carcassing to structural members in red. So clearly the specifics of your project and the weightings of labour, plant and material resources that you need to factor into that could vary significantly depending on what it is you're actually working on with and the proportion of the overall cost of these resources account for. So finally here, uh, looking at a couple of BCIS indices plotted against the CPI uh, from January 2021, we can really see how general inflation and movement in construction costs have differed. If you've had, entered a 24 month contract, for example, in February 21, there were months in that two year period when the difference between CPI and the civil engineering cost increases was over 11% whilst the difference between CPI and building cost increases was over 7%. For particularly volatile resource, that difference can be even more significant. In this chart, we can see that the same period, there were months when steelwork had increased 80% more than CPI. If you're using indices like CPI or the RPI to inflate your construction costs, I would really, again, very strongly recommend watching some of the recent webinars um, especially around ones using the rice index to manage inflationary risk. Um, I'm sure um, we can probably actually include a link um, and we'll follow up an email for the webinar for this. Um, but again, I highly recommend it. So uh, moving on, uh, another way in which the environment we are working on can impact costs is, of course, where we are in the country. BCIS produces location factors which can be used to adjust pro uh, project estimates according to where the work is actually taking place within the UK. Uh, the two examples in those figures, uh, which have been calculated for our 24 estimating guides, um, it probably won't come as a surprise to you to see there can be a significant difference between the average costs in different areas of the UK. Um, but of course, even with a geographical location, the specific setting of the project has a huge influence on costs. So. Is there open access or are you going to have to navigate a concrete delivery through the narrow streets of London uh, during rush hour? Uh, in a refurbishment project, will the building remain partially occupied? What site deliveries are possible and will the location give the rise of increased delivery charges? Are you working on almost identical projects to the one you did last year, but now major infrastructure project in the area um, has snapped up local labour forces? Is the project going to be completed through a pleasant spring? Uh, and a summer or a miserable autumn and winter um, or a miserable summer, because we apparently all know what that feels like this year. Um, these are all the types of questions which, as you progress through those stages and increasing knowledge and increasing cost certainty, you might need to be able to translate into cost data. So looking at the future, your project, by virtue of its location, could be impacted by local schemes and planning frameworks. As an example, uh, embodied carbon emissions are not regulated at national level, but 
the Greater London Authority with its London Plan Guidance and the City of London Corporation with its strategic looking at the whole life cycle carbon uh, optioneering are both potentially setting a precedent for the country. What impact might something like this make on the specifications for your project? And where would you get the appropriate cost data from? So we've talked about all kinds of cost data uh, we deal with and the ways in which we can be impacted by those external forces. In order to understand why it's so important to use appropriate and reliable data, it makes sense to consider what the alternative actually is and what the consequences of using inappropriate data might be. Well, <laughs> hopefully nothing so dramatic as this, um, but the worst case scenario for construction firms, uh, which we've been seeing a lot of about in the news, particularly in recent months, uh, is of course insolvency and the death of businesses. At BCIS, we've been following the news on this closely and some of the reasons for which have been cited for financial difficulties that have led to construction firms at this point. Unsurprisingly, the nature of contracts and payment cycles in the industry is playing a big part. Now, for context, Let's look at the figures here published by the Insolvency Service. The number of registered construction companies insolvencies in June brought the total for the 12 months up to that point to 4,282. From June 22 to May 23, the latest figures we have for self-employment, there were a further 347 self-employed bankruptcies in construction. And looking at the data, which goes back to January 2019, 18% of insolvencies have all been in construction, which is disproportionately high for the number of construction firms there are in England and Wales. Within these headline figures, we can look at all kinds of construction firms that have been affected. The Insolvency Service reports on England and Wales together, and also for Scotland, uh, which we'll look at next. Um, it does also report insolvency figures for Northern Ireland, um, but unfortunately it doesn't break down to industry, so we can't take a look at the construction industry specifically. In this first chart, uh, going back to the beginning of January 2019, we can see clearly that the firms categorised as providing specialist construction activities, which is the yellow line um, below the all in line, are consistently the worst affected. Relatively unaffected seems to be the civil engineering firms. Fewer in number two, um, start but perhaps, but also not surprising when infrastructure output has recently been the buoyant sector amid a downturn in other parts of the industry. You can also see in the movement of insolvencies here uh, where lockdown and the various forms of financial support were offered through COVID have had an impact and of course the climb out of that period. And again in Scotland, uh, much smaller numbers but in the same pattern with the specialised construction activities in yellow, uh, this category includes companies providing a range of work, typically on subcontract basis, uh, from demolition and site preparation to electrical and plumbing installation and finished work like plastering, painting and glazing. And with that, what we know about these kinds of specialist firms being at the mercy of contractors when it comes to the kinds of contracts they enter into, the tight margins they're operating with, who they're in the supply chain with and how difficult it can be to manage cash flow, it isn't really a surprise. Now, we've also been looking at uh, following reports from EY Parthenon, uh, who you may better know as Ernst & Young, uh, which tracks profit warnings from listed companies. Uh, so monitoring things like statements that these firms have put on to shareholders. Uh, in a recent report, looking back at 20 years worth of profit warning data, the EY team said it's clear that the construction industry is particularly vulnerable to financial difficulty. Reflecting again that we've seen in the news and from those companies, EY say their analysis show this is part due to the fact that the contract cycle that construction firms of course tend to be exposed to. Clearly insolvencies are not caused by inappropriate use of construction cost data alone. We know that. Um, at BCIS, we can do a lot of things, but we certainly uh, actually can't change the price of steel. We can't magically fix labour supply shortage, and we certainly can't control energy prices. Uh, these things are sadly uh, beyond all of our control, and so we will continue to see the impact of those factors on prices and then on businesses. However, we can help the industry to mitigate certain risks. With the greater cost certainty comes with better cash flow management and the ability to make better informed decisions about entering into contracts, what the terms of those contracts may be, and how to successfully navigate those supply chain and contract cycles, which, as we all know, uh, often don't carry comfortable margins of profit, which could otherwise act as a buffer. 
in a firm enters into a fixed price contract because it will otherwise lose out on the work. Clearly, the ability to use reliable cost data in Estimus is of the utmost importance. So we know what might happen if we use appropriate data, but we should be doing to ensure we're using the best possible cost data for our specific projects. Uh, as I've said throughout, it's all about knowledge, the what, when, where and how of the project and linking all of that back to reliable sources of cost data. How accurate can you be if you're not linking your costs and movement in those costs back to the relevant source? It's important to evaluate your data sources. The kind of questions that you need to ask the cost data you are using are, is it reputable, creditable? Is there any bias at play? And most importantly, is it relevant? Does it relate to, or can it be made to relate to the project in question? Or is it based on something completely different that you're comparing apples and oranges, or in inflationary terms, a basket of totally unrelated goods and services and a basket of actual construction goods. This is the kind of picture you will see when people are talking about consumer and price index for retail, just to highlight what actually goes into those indices. And these are the items categorised as CPI, including here owner occupiers housing costs, uh, which I think we'd all struggle to map against the constituent part of construction project. Um, although some of it sounds delicious because they do include rump steaks and loin chops in food items, um, I'd like to give a couple more examples in which way we can help to improve cost estimating and which might be useful to think about. So this is a screen grab from our schedule of rates, uh, which is our set of online estimating guides. Uh, as you can see, there are a number of customer adjustments that can be made, um, which is the overall factor that is applied to estimates that are creating. At the top there, you can see um, you can use the all intended price index or our general building cost index to apply inflationary factors. The tender price index measures accepted tenders and therefore includes market forces on margins and productivity, while the cost index measures factory gate materials prices and wage agreements. Um, I've just punched in some random uh, choices there, but as you can see, a few adjustments which reflect the circumstances for the project can make a significant difference to the expected costs. As another example, uh, I've touched on the impact of selling of a project can make to costs. Uh, when we compare new work on a site to alterations on existing building, there are clearly cost implications. In those kinds of projects, we might typically see a reduction in output, smaller discounts, increased carriage charges and increased supervision. Because of the more costly nature of alterations of refurbished work, a plus rate is added to the hourly calculations in our alterations and refurb data sets. So uh, to hopefully bring together uh, and to confidently declare that we're not applying CPI to the prices we collected two years ago, um, we're not using the prices we have for a project in Scotland for our next one in the southeast of England without adjustments. Uh, we're using reliable cost data. What impact do we think this will have on your projects? So crucially, we believe using reliable cost data because you have increased cost certainty uh, will result in better cash flow management and the ability to budget the projects accordingly. With the volatility that construction projects across the industry are exposed to at all times, particularly at the moment, anything that can narrow in where you are in that funnel of cost certainty is of huge value. When tendering for work, the ability to produce competitive quotes that are neither over nor underestimating could make the difference in winning the work. More crucially, it could determine how much, if any, profit it actually makes. When you're entering into a fixed price contract, uh, as we know, sometimes this is done reluctantly, um, but without any real choice, you can be more confident that the prices you're estimating are not going to come back to bite you. Further, an estimate in which you have increased cost certainty is almost one which provides a more solid foundation from which you can look to identify potential cost savings and opportunities for value engineering. Access to reliable cost data will give you the most options that you don't have um, and only considering the cost you already have at your disposal. Um, it gives you the ability to compare and contrast different methods, materials and product specifications so you can make a better informed decision about what it is best for your project. This is going to become even more important in the future when projects will no doubt have to fully consider and report the green credentials of the resources going into them. 
Um, it also means that you can confidently estimate costs for work on particular resources or composite rates that you haven't priced for. Hopefully it wouldn't be necessary in this context, um, but having an auditable trail of where you have got your costs from at this point in time to be useful if you become involved in any potential disputes. And ultimately, uh, you're using appropriate cost data, which you can apply quite easily to your project specifics. Um, it's much less time consuming than trying to pull resources of data together, some of which might have a lot of work to make applicable and relevant to what you're doing. Um, in itself, this is clearly a cost saving through being able to work much more efficiently. Well, uh, that brings me to the end of the webinar. Brings me to the end of the webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us all this morning. Um, this is the first webinar we've done recently covering construction cost data. And um, I'm conscious that uh, while we've covered a lot of ground with the spectrum of data that we have with, um, we've also sped over some of the areas of work. So things like um, life cycle costings, maintenance costs and carbon data. Um, so if there's anything else in this area you'd like us to cover for future webinars, please just let us know in the feedback. Um, if you haven't already submitted any questions, uh, you have or think of something later, you can include them on the feedback survey um, and we'll pick them up. Um, our next webinar coming up at the end of September will be our quarterly update on construction cost inflation. So hugely relevant for the kinds of issues we've covered today. We'll send out some more details on how you can register that in due course. Um, in the meantime, please get in touch with us um, if we can help with anything at all regarding your construction cost needs. So thank you once again and I hope you all have a wonderful day.